afternoon. Welcome to our um, weekly multimodality meeting conference. Uh, my name is Suming Chang. I'm the uh, one of the cardiologists at the CT lab here in the Methodist Bacon Heart Vascular Center. Today, we're going to talk about some current technology and basic principle of cardiac CT. Let's advance to the next slide. Cardiac CT has become one of the most utilized non-invasive imaging modality because it allows you to look at the lumen stenosis of the coronaries, um, the plaque characteristics, can also give you functional analysis, both of the LB function or coronary physiology, uh, look at myocardium, uh, and also uh, has been uh, very utilized for valvular structure evaluation. So how do we get to this stage of uh, sophisticated imaging and which you give you incredible detail of the cardiac structure? So today the outline will talk about a little bit the basic principle, uh, the technology behind generating these images, and a little bit about the in terms of techniques focused mostly in acquisitions. Okay. So what's the basic of a cardiac CT? How is the image uh, being generated? So basically, we have an X-ray tube, uh, which essentially um, generate a bunch of energy, which uh, then uh, go through a cardometer and then reach the patient the patient's tissue attenuate the x-ray, and the resu resulting uh, photon is captured by the detector, and then go through uh, some uh, computer generation, uh, generate the images. As you can see, for each uh, single transmission through the patient, in order for us to generate an image of x-ray, we generate about a thousand different line of images. So each projection of view is a consequence or result of a thousand of X-ray transmission going through the patient. So it's a lot of data involved. And this is just uh, the hardware being used to generate these images. Uh, you can see the main components of the tube where the energy is generated by heating up the uh, uh, generator, and then you have the cardometer, which is focus energy directed toward the patient, attenuated patient. Patient is right in the middle of the the table, and the other side of the table are the detectors, which capture uh, the signal of the, of the electron after going through the patient. So, the X-ray tube generate this is. One of the most basic thing about a CT in terms of X-ray tube, we determine the tube current, we call that MA. It's the amount of energy used to create a certain amount of radiation, and essentially is proportional to the quantity of photons, meaning more photons, more MA. So there, therefore, if you increase the tube current, you increase the amount of radiation. And if, if you increase the time the patient exposed to the certain amount of photons, you have the concept, what we call MAS. So it's really straightforward in terms of uh, everything whole constant. If you increase the tube current by two folds, the patient's going to be exposed to twice of the radiation, if you increase the exposure time by two-folds, you're going to increase the radiation by two-folds. So, so this is straightforward. 
And there is a way of modulating the amount of photons that you X-ray tube is generating. And this is done with some planning scan. Uh, if you have, uh, basically, you want to direct the most amount of photons through the area of interest and in the peripheral part of your in region of interest, you X -ray, your X-ray tube, you can program for the X-ray tube to generate less um, photons so you don't have that much radiation to the patient. And this is a typical example. So besides the region of interest, you can always also modulate the period in which the photon uh, amount could be reduced such in this case of uh, one of those CT acquisition techniques, it's called retrospective CT, retrospective ECG gating. So you can control the tube current through different part of the cardiac cycle. So for instance, in diastole, when the heart is still, you can increase the MA or tube current on the left-hand side. Or on the right-hand side, you can see during systole, where there's a lot of motion, it's difficult to evaluate the coronary. You purpose, 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 uh, on purpose, we decrease the tube current. So overall, we will reduce the amount of radiation. The other big concept is the peak kilo voltage. It's defined by the maximum voltage or energy that you apply to the photon coming out of X-ray tube. Okay, essentially, it's the highest, it's, it's the highest possible kinetic energy of the photon that you, uh, electron that you generate. So, for instance, the uh, difference from the tube current that we mentioned earlier, the amount of radiation is not directly proportional to the, uh, to the energy, but rather to the, square, to, uh, to the square root. So if you have a 14% decrease in tube courage from 40, 140 to 120, you reduce exposure by 30 to 35 percent. So this is a very important concept for us to try to minimize the amount of radiation given to the patient. So the tube voltage is essentially is an average effect of the penetration ability of all the X-ray beam that you generate. So, so KVP is the peak energy, the highest energy that you apply to the tube and the resulting average is called tube voltage. And that kind of controls the overall image quality or radio, radio, radiographic contrast. And uh, together with the tissue, uh, tissue characteristic or tissue attenuation, uh, you essentially end up with uh, the attenuation coefficient and uh, 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 the, the image quality in terms of contrast and noise. As you can see in the right, left hand side, 140 kV, uh, everything looks more homogeneous. And the 80 kV, which is much lower energy, is a lot more attenuation, uh, more noisy image. This is a, just a clinical example of a patient who was scanned twice in different locations using different uh, kV, as you can see in the left hand side. The 120 kV was given. I'm sorry, let me get back. And the right hand side, the 90 kV was given. Uh, so you can see in the right hand side, the lower kV, uh, the image quality is a little bit in the noisy side, but you have more contrast. So that's the main difference. Uh, so you, in, in, with higher kV, you have a more detail, uh, better contrast noise resolution, and the, uh, the lower KV, uh, there's more noise. So it's a trade-off that like sometimes you need to make the decision. Depends if you're more interested in, in more contrast or you are interested in more, uh, you're interested in more uh, detail in which you will use higher KV. If you want a more contrast signal, you use lower KV. Okay, so the other question is obviously the noise does not only de depend on the KV, it depends on the patient size. 
So you have a lot of soft tissue, you're gonna have more noise, overcome that. Uh, there's no mystery here. You need higher, give more photon and give more photon with higher energy. So the rule of thumb is if the noise level uh, double for every eight centimeter increase a patient's circumferential diameter. So what data are we actually acquiring? So, so you can see the x-ray tube generate uh, 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 electrons go through the patients and you have attenuations and, and the attenuation co uh, coefficient reflect the degree the x-ray intensity is stopped or reduced by a material and the result is being captured by the detector. So this is uh, Sir Hansfield uh, um, most famous contribution is for the co CT coefficient, each tissue has different component, therefore it's gonna attenuate the X-ray in a different degree, and the resulting attenuation displaying in a gray scale, that's what we call the Hounsville unit. So by convention, uh, when you have attenuation of water is zero, and air, which much less dense, will be negative, and bone or calcium or metal, which is a very high density, it's going to attenuate the X-ray a lot. It's going to have high Hansel unit. This is just a typical example of a CT of contrast throughout the chest. As you can see, uh, the air in the left upper corner is negative, and then we, and, and right in the middle, on the top, uh, we put the regional interest electro, which is metal, so the, so the attenuation is very high, almost 3,000. Uh, you can see uh, the area surrounding the, f the heart, which is the fat tissue, it's going to have attenuation of around negative 100. And, uh, uh, and the contrast that we're giving the patient inside the LV cavity is going to be, the, uh, in this case, about 200 to 300 and the myocardium with contrast is going to be about 100. So that's how we do uh, the tissue characterization with CT. We do that every day. Uh, obviously, there's a lot of overlap, and sometimes things is not as clear cut. Uh, but sometimes uh, the one thing the CT does very well, you can separate between uh, tissue with high density, in this case calcium, in the left hand side. And the right hand side, we can see very well um, tissue with negative uh, Hansville units such as fat. So between calcium and fat, CT can differentiate very well. Uh, so such as this another this case, another example. Or for instance, this case a patient with history of uh, coronary, this is an example of uh, consequences of a coronary vein. Uh, you can see in the left hand, in the right upper corner right here, uh, all the calcium after uh, all myocardial infarction. Uh, you can see there, there's a thing, that, this is a VSD, and, uh, and this, uh, and here's a case of a patient with a pseudoaneurysm. So all this the tissue characteristic help us understand and inter interpret the study. Again, uh, okay, I'm sorry, going backward. Okay, so let's talk about a little bit of the techniques that we can uh, obtain a CT scan. It's essential to have an ECG gating because heart contract and relax. So overcome the cardiac motion, the data from a single phase of a cardiac cycle through uh, several heartbeats, depending on the technique, is combined and uh, the motion is frozen, and there, therefore uh, uh, the finding represent the heart appearance are cer at that certain part of the cardiac cycle. Uh, we can uh, split the cardiac cycle in uh, in number of phases you want, but uh, the true significance of that is limited by the true car uh, temporal resolution. We can talk a little bit later on. So this is an example of patient uh, who has a localized 
aortic dissection. The top is a non gate as you can see uh, right here. Uh, this call, we call hurricane sign. It's a bit blurry, so one cannot be sure if this is a, a normal finding. Is it due to motion, as you can see there? It's a thicker slice as well, so, he, he, so it's much more difficult. Here is a gay distance, as you can see clearly, this is a patient with localized dissection and it was uh, very well seen in the different projection. So for everything that moves, uh, cardiac CT was definitely one of them. ECG gating is essential. So the second thing we need to know about is difference between helical versus sequential. You're going to have uh, run into different name. Uh, one is called retrospective gating, which is the same as helical. Prospective gating will be sequential. Spiral will be helical. Axial is the same as sequential. Continuous will be helical. And step and shoes is another uh, name for uh, sequential imaging. So let's see what the main difference is. So helical scanmo, essentially, you have continuous data acquisition and table fee, meaning that x-ray is on the whole time when patient laying on the table, and the table is moving through uh, the x-ray tube. So everything is continuous. There's no, uh, there's no stop. So that's why we call it continuous helical spiral. Uh, so the main concept of the pitch, uh, pitch is an uh, important concept, which is um, essentially is a re relationship between how fast the patient is moving through uh, the detector and how big the detector is. So it's essentially uh, a ratio between the table feed and the rotation slide width, meaning how wide is the detector. So. Uh, you can imagine if the table move very slowly in relative to the width of the detector, patient is going to get more radiation. If the, and the, in which case, uh, the sp because the table feed is slower, you're going to have a lower pitch. On the other hand, if you move the table very fast, you're going to have a higher pitch. And with higher pitch, basically patient uh, is in contact with the x-ray source with less time, therefore it's going to have uh, less radiation. And there's other factors also, the heart rate, but essentially it's how fast the table is moved. So, so the other main uh, imaging technique is prospective gating or step and shoot. So different from the prior technique, uh, the x-ray source is not on technically all the time, but essentially only when uh, during certain part, certain beats that you predetermine, meaning that the table move, stop, the x-ray is on, take picture, and then the x-ray source is off, table move, the different position, and then on, and so on and so forth. So you can see that uh, you can de determine uh, a priority how wide or how much time you want to image uh, we, when the x-ray is on. So you can technically acquire only a very narrow or open it up window to a, a wider part of the cardiac cycle each time you want to image the patient. So this is kind of like a, a, a representative representation of the retrospective gating versus prospective gating. At the top, you can see the shadow here. Uh, the x-ray is on all the time, it only go up doing part of the cardiac cycle you're interested, but, but the tube is on the whole time, versus prospective gating, the x-ray tube is only on during predetermined part of the cardiac cycle. As you can see right here, the difference, so this will, this will, be, this will be prospective, and this will be a spiral or retrospective gating. Uh, the difference, uh, the main development, one of the major, the major development of the cardiac CT is the introduc introduction of dual source CT, who allows uh, us to move the table really fast 
because we have two tubes, so there's no, to avoid uh, uh, drop uh, a data gap, we allow us to move the table real fast and come up with uh, what we call high pitch acquisition. Uh, essentially, you can move the table up to almost 80 to 85 centimeter per second. So for the whole heart, who entire, entire region of interest around the heart, which is about 20 centimeter, technically you can image the heart uh, within a quarter to one third uh, of a second. Uh, so since the pitch is high, meaning that table move faster in relative to the width of the detector, uh, there's no uh, redundant data so the dosage is much lower compared to uh, retrospective gating uh, with slow pitch. Um, there's a lot of redundant data. The dosage is higher. So uh, for the flash mode, as was called, although it's low dose, it is a helical or spiral acquisition. Okay. Um, the difference between one and the other is since there's no redundancy of data, if you have a PVC or extra systole and you have, um, you cannot, there's no redundant data for you to edit it to improve the image quality. So that's the main disadvantage of helical high pitch mode. You have one shot and that's it. Versus similar helical spiral acquisition in which there is a lot of redundant data. If you have a PVC, create some artifact, potentially you can edit out uh, part of the data set and reconstruct the images to get rid of the artifact, obviously at a cost of higher uh, radiation dosage. Okay, so the flash mode, turbo flash, is this difference in between the speed. Uh, so uh, essentially the pitch with the flash, turbo flash mode is about 3.2. Uh, so you can uh, acquire the whole heart in the, during the R interval uh, in less, in sing, in, basically you can acquire the entire data set in one single heartbeat and only, only during a certain part of the uh, R interval. In this case, you can place either in diastole or systole. So this is a schematic representation between a single source and dual source a spiral mode. Um, so, okay. Let's talk about the spatial resolution of our CT. CT, uh, spatial re resolution is defined as the narrowest distance between the two objects which could be discriminated. And in, in plane is between X and Y axis. Essentially, it's delineated by the geographic characteristics of the scanner or detector, which most of the CT scan we use, uh, the th thickness of each detector uh, is about 0.4, so it's 0.4, 0.6. And you have the through plane, which I'm sorry, is, that's determined by the width of the collimator or detector. That's also 0 0.5. So essentially, you have uh, the O3 axis has a same uh, same resolution. You create isotropic images, so you can have a voxel with all three axes at different resolution, uh, the same resolution, and that allows us to uh, calculate uh, the volume without distortion of the images throughout any plane that you can manipulate the images. Uh, as a result, and just to give you an idea. Uh, this is still not as good as uh, invasive angiogram that we in the cath lab, in which the temper spatial resolution is the order of 0 0.1, 0 0.2 millimeter. So as a result, uh, so only CTA uh, can only reliably differentiate stenosis within about 20 25% accuracy compared to 10% of a QCA or quantitative invasive coronary angiography, so which is important for us when we interpret the CT, we don't, it's very, uh, it's really not true when we can say it's a 90% or 70% stenosis. So the range is uh, about 25%. That's why when we report 
uh, CTA result, we report within the range that save 25 to 50 percent stenosis, for instance. Okay, so this is a collimation or slide width. Um, so this is um, essentially um, you can change the collimation or slide width. Obviously, thinner slices, you're going to have better spatial resolution. But however, the problem is uh, you have, you're going to have less signal, so it's going to be noisier. So therefore, um, currently, uh, the, the spatial resolution of CT is limited by the noise it generates because uh, uh, when we use um, very thin slices, we would need to use much higher energy, KV or MA, to generate more uh, signal. And so theoretically, you can build a very thin accotimator with very good spatial resolution, but you would have to uh, use a lot of uh, uh, radiation overall. But there's some uh, techniques that we can overcome in terms of improving the noise, such as improving the uh, detector materials, improving the uh, processing, uh, and also with a reconstruction algorithm. And, and there's quite a few advances with the new um, machine. Uh, some of the vendor now have a thickness of 0 0.25 uh, millimeter of collimator. Okay. Uh, so this is just an example um, of um, uh, reconstruction uh, acquisition with the thinner slices. As you can see, uh, the, it's, uh, it's, there's more noise compared to the bottom part with the thick slice uh, collimation within the same patient. Um, but you have better edge detections compared to the thick slices. You kind of lose the detail and uh, you have much less uh, partial volume uh, artifact compared to thick slices. So the temporal resolution is the ability to uh, resolve the moving object as kind of the shutter speed of the, a camera. You know, you don't have a camera with a better shutter speed. You can uh, image or take picture of a moving object without uh, um, blurring uh, the images. And uh, basically, it's, uh, uh, this is essential for, for, cardiac, for cardiac imaging because heart moves. And uh, if the temporal resolution is not good enough, you're going to have motion artifact and, uh, uh, and bad image quality. What determines the temporal resolution of a scanner? Uh, it's determined how fast the gantry can rotate. Um, Gantry is, is where the detectors are mounted uh, because of the uh, circumf geometry. We only need 180 degrees plus 10 degree of uh, acquisition. So, by so the temporal resolution is that gantry rotation uh, divided by two, and that's for a single detector. Uh, if you have two detector, uh, sorry, you have two detector. Uh, you can only you only need to acquire about 90 degrees, so the space to get the temporal resolution of a dual source CT would be the gantry rotation divided by four. Um, so, which is critical for uh, we we'll talk about cardiac motion is um, we want to image the heart when the heart doesn't move as much, and we all know the length of systole and diastole is a function of heart rate. Uh, mostly affect the diastole because systolic duration is mostly fixed and the change of the heart rate result usually and change of uh, the diastolic duration. And uh, that's why if your patient has a slower heart rate, we usually do diastolic imaging. If the patient has fast heart rate, uh, it's more reliable that you know by the end of systole or during part of late systole and end of systole, the heart usually doesn't move as much. Okay, so this is just people had done uh, 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 detailed analysis of the, uh, in terms of cardiac motions um, throughout the cardiac cycle. Uh, so this is um, different heart rate uh, in terms of image quality and, the, and, uh, and, the, and milliseconds after the R peak. As you can see, uh, the motion is the least 
right here in patients reasonable heart rate in s around uh, mid diastolic or diastasis or the other area that could be used is here it's about 300 milliseconds after the peak R wave or what we call systolic imaging the gyratory rotation speed varies from scanner to scanner the first generation 64 slide CT we had before 2016 is around 400 millisecond. As you can see here in the picture, in the, in the movie here, the newest scanner is about, can, be, can, can go as low as 220, 240 millisecond. And obviously it's limited by centrifugal forces. Uh, and there's a reason why we cover the camera and the gantry, because I doubt anybody want to go in there when the gantry is rotating that quickly. Uh, so with the dual detector, again, I mentioned earlier, uh, the newest scanner, uh, the spatial resolution, simple resolution uh, is about, um, uh, the gantry rotation time is 220 millisecond uh, divided by four. So the temporal resolution is about 55 millisecond. And this is again, uh, the high pitch mode that I mentioned earlier. Um, okay, okay, sorry, the movie is not playing. So this is an example of a schematic representation of a flash acquisition or high pitch mode. As you can see, uh, table accelerate real quickly. This is, this is a regular scan, normal pitch, slow motion. Okay, and this is when we place a uh, container with water. And since acquisition, acquisition is so fast, uh, you can even image the, uh, uh, what we call free breathing, uh, cardiac CT. The patient doesn't have to hold their breath and it's very useful for, especially for pediatric imaging. As you can see here, uh, 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 imaging of a, uh, of a of a doll putting a moving a cradle. Uh, you can see with a single source standard spiral mode is a lot of artifact uh, with, with high pitch mode. Uh, image quality is just much better. Okay. So uh, this is going back to emphasize uh, for, the, for, the, for our fellows that if you have a low heart rate, as I mentioned earlier, with a curve between the cardiac motions and the uh, uh, period in which heart has less cardiac motion, with the whole heart rate and, and diastole is the best. Uh, with the high heart rate and systole, you're gonna have better uh, result. So other type of scanner is what we call white detector scanner. So most of the scanner uh, being used, what we call 64 slice CT, essentially with the detector slices of 0 0.625 millimeter, if you multiply by 64, so essentially the whole detector width is about four centimeter. That means that in order to, uh, to cover the whole heart, you need to at least go around four times the heart to cover a 16 centimeter of the cardiac, uh, of a regular size heart. But if you have a detector, I'm sorry, if you have a um, a scanner, instead of a 64 detector, you can have 250, 256, uh, essentially four times larger. You can essentially cover the whole heart with one single rotation. And that's what two of the major vendor has gone. Uh, so we have 256 detector of 0 0.625 millimeter each, or 320 detectors which with 0 0.5 millimeter each at the end result, meaning the detector with uh, the entire detector uh, covers 16 centimeter, okay? So essentially what it allows you to do is also allows you to do one beat load dose imaging. So you can see right there, here we don't have any uh, well, here, the technique that we use is prospective. 
because the table doesn't have to move anymore, unlike a CT scanner with, a, with, with narrow uh, detector width, because uh, with single rotation, uh, essentially the whole heart can be imaged exactly the same time. So here, all, so therefore, with the white detector CT scanner, there's no, for cardiac imaging at least, there's, we don't, there's no such thing, we don't, we don't use helical mode to acquire the image anymore unless the patient need have also evaluation of the bypass graph. But in that case, uh, either that, uh, either, e e even in that situation, we just move the table using perspective or step and shoot. So just to summarize it, when we talk about retrospective helical spiral, would only apply to the uh, CT scanner with um, a regular or smaller size detector with a white detector CTA. Uh, essentially, all the acquisition mode use perspective or step and shoot or sequential or actual. They all the uh, synonym. Okay. So basically, this is a, a kind of example of, of 64 slide CT. You need four uh, rotation. You have four images. You stitch them together versus one single uh, rotation cover the entire heart. I see the main difference is here, the top of the heart is, a, is image at an earlier time compared to the the bottom of the heart, in, w in where this image right here, the entire region of uh, uh, that you scan, are image exactly at the same time, and that has a, a repercussion in terms of when you want to do uh, myocardial perfusion. Uh, so this is an example of how a medical center look like if you have a UFO flying around. Uh, so this is you know by the time you image. We get to the other side of the medical center, the, the UFO already get there. But truly, when they image, image the uh, UFO, which equivalent of a contrast, that goes through the cardiovascular structure. So this is when you actually, uh, the location of the uh, moving objects, I should say. OK. So um, again, um, so the, main, the other main difference, obviously, you can uh, see here is with a uh, uh, step with, a, with 64 detect, uh, detector CT, uh, you, have four, you, know, you have several images being stitched together. You can see clearly the contrast is different uh, compared to the bottom part uh, because the contrast has been moving through the cardiovascular versus, in this case, everything looks perfectly homogeneous and you avoid what we call step artifact caused by slight variation of the, uh, the heart rate. Okay, so you can acquire excellent image quality um, with very low dose. We are very fortunate in our, um, in our medical, uh, medical center system. We have bo both access to uh, high pH dual source scan capability and also we have capacity of doing white detectors or single BCT. So that's part of the talk. I want to clarify some of the confusion that some people might have when we talk about um, CT, 4D CT, gated CT, dynamic CT. Oftentimes we get, so well, can you give me a dynamic CT? OK, uh, most of people probably cannot or don't understand the main difference between dynamic CT and 4D CT. So I want to try to see if we can, for the last 10 minutes, try to uh, see what is the difference. Dynam the true dynamic CT, uh, I'm sorry, CT imaging, the best term is probably used, it's called, we call time resolve uh, CT image. So basically, you want to see how the, allow you to see, I apologize, I allow you to see how the contrast travel through the arterial capillary venous system. So, so basically, you inject the contrast um, at the entrance of vascular. In this case, let's say we have the coronary artery of the heart. So you have the contrast in the coronary arteries. So the, with sequential scan, 
a different level of the organ of interest, after some time, the contra is going to be gone from the coronary arteries and it's going to go to the capillary and get into the myocardium. That's when we focus on myocardial perfusion imaging. And for the arterial phase, when the contrast is in, ar in the artery, that's why we do CT, coronary CTA, that's why it's th objective. Okay, so, and for those EP guys who want to see the vein, they would like to see the heart, they want to image the heart at a later stage when most of the contrast has left the myocardium and gone into the uh, cardiac vein system. As you can see, you can uh, actually plot uh, the time contrast intensity curve, and you can allow you to, to, to see the contrast uh, transit time, and this is what we do for myocardial perfusion. That's true dynamic CT, or again, I think the best way is to avoid confusion is call time resolve CTA, okay? So it allows you, main objectives allow you to see the organ perfusion and arterial venous malformation. That's the main, or you wanna see the tumor perfusion, uh, any mass, uh, my car uh, cardiac mass perfusion. So this will be uh, the protocol to use. So cardiovascular CTA, uh, again, uh, as I mentioned earlier, uh, when we do cardiac CTA, most of the time, we're not really doing a time resolve in a sense. We only look at certain part of the, of the arterial venous uh, transit. So for coronary CTA, we're interested, again, when the contrast is in the arteries for myocardial perfusion, static, you know, will be the capillary. And for cardiac vein, it's later, okay? So... So 4D CT is not exactly a dynamic CT because it's not a time resolve in a sense. It's just a display of 3D CT that's in motion and the fourth dimension is the time. So we only see the motion throughout the cardiac cycle, systole and diastole, or throughout the arterial venous phase, but only one single point of, uh, of the arterial venous phase. So for instance, this is, will be a 3D images, but it's not a 4D because although it moves, I'm not seeing any different part of the cardiac cycle. So this is only a 3D images, okay? So on the right-hand side, this will be a, for, for instance, a 4D data sets because the 3D rendering plus time resolve, excuse me, uh, plus uh, gated, so you can see part of the cardiac cycle from cystic to diastole. But in terms of arterial venous, this is still most of the contrast is in the arterial phase. So we, we're not really imaging anything. We, we don't have information regarding the blood flow through the myocardium. Or not. And this is a, a, a beautiful example of myocardial bridge. Uh, you can see here the milking effect of a patient with a significant myocardial bridge. Okay, so this will be an example, again, of a 4D images right here, okay, of a, of, of a mitral valve and my sub, subvalvular apparatus. Okay, this is an example, again, a patient with a, a prosthetic aortic valve, and this is another example, I'm sorry, this is not playing well, a patient with a, a aortic dissection, uh, that you can see how the dissection flap move through the cardiac cycle, okay? But again, this is still a 4D CTA. This is not a dynamic CT, okay? Okay, so this is just another example of different display. So the true um, dynamic CTA or time resolve with this example here, a myocardial perfusion, uh, as you can see, contrast get into the RV, get into the, subsequently to the LV and then and throughout, through the myocardium. And uh, again, this is another example of a cardiac perfusion. Or for peripheral vasculature, which probably currently the most uh, utilized 
um, indication for time resolved is for peripheral vascular. As you can see here, uh, this uh, emulate uh, a, a, a digital subtracted CT, uh, CT angiogram. As you can see, the, uh, the contract flow through the arterial and then, uh, and then through the venous system. So I think uh, this is all I have for today. I'm happy to take any question from the fellows or anyone else who's listening. Any question? No? Okay, well thank you very much. <laughs>